The prince was talking about tides, I thought it was rather relevant because some of you have come from California and far-flung places. I've come 50 miles and it took me three hours this morning because of the largest storm surge since 1953 on the coast, um, which killed 300 people 60 years ago and didn't this time because fortunately we protected against those externalities of climate change. I thought that was kind of relevant to the bigger picture here. Um, Patrick asked me to talk a little bit about the emergence of understanding, the paper that Kenneth just referred to, some thoughts about method, and then some stuff about sustainability as well, just to link it together. Uh, the, my PowerPoint presentation is a little demonstration with water that I'll do in a short while. I'll leave you to wonder what it is, um, but I'll come to that. The emergence of understanding. Well, we heard, we've heard a bit about that. Patrick talked about it. The Prince talked about it. The modern agricultural revolution in industrialized countries and the green revolution in the tropics from the 50s and 60s onwards were true revolutions in agriculture. They led to large food increases. And, and that was a significant moment in, in human history. Then came, very shortly afterwards, about the same kind of time, an understanding that productivity also um, often comes with increased negative side effects, also known as spillover effects, also known as externalities. And the early evidence pointed towards pollutants, towards damage to wildlife, towards some human health threats. And of course it was in 1962 with Silent Spring, Rachel Carson pointed very poignantly to the story of the loss of the family farm that, that Patrick alluded to just earlier on, but, but primarily through just one mechanism, that bird losses were occurring through seed treatments. And this was well before there was any emergence of evidence on, on losses to predatory birds, for example. So that was 62. In 1991, I wrote a book with Gordon Conway called Unwelcome Harvest, where we tried to document the, a wider range of the negative side effects, looking at nitrogen, at pesticides, at heavy metals, largely from livestock, at farm wastes, air pollutants, and greenhouse gases. So again, there was a kind of a view that that covered most of the territory. That came at the end of a decade when straw burning was still common, for example, in Britain. And the, the, the pollutants from straw burning were a significant rural issue. But that was still only part of the picture. Just a point I want to make at this, at this point is that, of course, agriculture is not the sole polluter. Um, that's the, the topic of our discussions today. Um, it's not the sole polluter. Um, we are talking about that primarily. It's also the victim of pollution as well. And that we just need to kind of remember those little, little links. Agriculture also benefits from pollution. Here's a little heresy just to kind of to log. The mean um, deposition of nitrogen in the UK is 30 kilograms per hectare per year that comes from UK transport systems. So it's NOx coming from um, exhausts. Deposits nitrogen, that's a free input to agriculture. When we switch to electric cars, agriculture will suffer. So it's just a kind of thought there. Um, the first study, um, Ken mentioned this, the first study in the year 2000, we published the first national study that sought to put a cost on UK agricultural externalities. In 1998, we put a team together at the University of Essex with support, in particular, from David G of the European Environment Agency. Where are you, David? You're here somewhere. There he is. Um, he told me to mention his name at the, at the beginning, and I have. The agency. <laughs> the agency. Um, this was a study, multi-method, with many proxies. Um, uh, it was difficult to publish. One referee said, um, the authors should not dabble. They should leave this to proper economists, they said, <laughs> which made the economists on our team really cross, of course. <laughs> Agricultural Systems published the paper, and it had an immediate impact. At the time, it suggested that the total cost in the UK, using data available through the 1990s, was about £2.4 billion. Pounds. Um, that's equivalent to £208 pounds for every hectare of arable and permanent pasture in Britain. So just having a hectare of agriculture caused 200 pounds worth of, of external costs that were picked up elsewhere in, in the UK system. Um, largely this came from con contamination of drinking water with pesticides, 120 million a year to clean up, nitrate much smaller, about a tenth of that, cryptosporidium, 23 million, damage to wildlife, pollinators, habitats, hedgerows, emissions of gases, ammonia for example in particular, soil erosion, organic carbon losses, food poisoning, 
and at the time BSE was a big deal um, during the 90s. Some were not calculated. We couldn't put a figure on the costs of harm to human health from pesticides. Just too many products, too many mechanisms, too much uncertainty. We know there's a link there, but it was too difficult to put a cost on. So we didn't even look at them. So there's a point about method here. This is quite, quite in, interesting. The hidden costs at that time were larger than net farm income in the UK. That's worth noting. So that was a kind of worrying point. Um, other national studies followed. Study in Germany, in the USA, in China. Darko Znor, one of my PhD students, you saw him in the, he's over there, was talking about the Croatian work that he's done. He was in the, in the video that you just saw. So we had a number of kind of other um, uh, studies in other countries simply showing that costs were different in different places. It was kind of not surprising, really, because ecosystems are different, economies are different, cult cultures are, are, are different. Um, there were criticisms. Farmers and farm interests were very cross. Uh, I was called into DEFRA. They were not cross. They liked it. Um, uh, there was a, a fair criticism, criticism of the time that we had not calculated the positive externalities and therefore it was unbalanced. We just looked at the bads that were being produced by agriculture rather than looking at the goods. Um, I wish we had. It probably would have taken us another three or four years to do the work, so it's probably better that we got something published. Um, but the notion that agriculture contributes positively to natural capital, landscape services, wildlife, human health, all of that I think is kind of well established now, but wasn't at the time. Uh, the National Ecosystem Assessment that was published in 2011, that big brick of a book, useful for holding the door open, um, that essentially said agriculture produces lots of positive externalities and put some numbers on it. So that, that picked up the baton at that point. Um, in 2005, uh, a later paper published in Food Systems with Tim Lang, who you're about to hear from in a moment, recalculated the externalities and suggested they were lower. So some things had changed, and this is important. Over time, the, the impacts of systems change. Um, uh, but what we also did is change the system boundary. And, there's, and I don't want to kind of make a point here about method and system boundaries. This is really quite important when we're comparing costs of different systems. Um, we had previously calculated the costs up to the farm gate, but in this study, we calculated the costs all the way to the plate, so right the way through the food system. Um, and, of course, used the term that Tim came up with first of, uh, of calculating the cost of food miles. What that then showed was that the food mile costs were greater than the environmental costs on farm. Uh, and then it showed that the shopping trip food miles were the greatest component. So one in four of the lorries or trucks on the UK roads carries agricultural produce, either food or inputs. So count them when you're driving. One, two, three, four. There's one. One, two, three, four. So our food is being moved, our inputs are being moved all over the place, and yet it is the shopping trips, those little down to the supermarket and back again, that has the biggest impact. Now, you might say that's not very surprising because transport is pretty wrecked and we know it in introduces lots of externalities. But again, it makes this point about, about system boundaries. Um, in the end, there's only one system boundary that matters, and that's finite earth. We can carry on going. But at a, there's one point, and that's your lot. Finite earth is not another one beyond that system boundary. And I think that's worth kind of remembering when we... When we um, uh, think about these things. So all studies on hidden costs raise questions about types of farming, choices that we make, the proximity of production and consumption, how far do you have to move stuff to eat it. Um, one, of our, one of the outcomes of the food mile study that Tim and I are involved in, with showed that the international food miles were trivial in comparison to the domestic ones. So a lot of people have got kind of hot under the collar saying you shouldn't buy stuff from third world farmers, developing country farmers, tropical farmers, because it's coming a long way. Actually, the volumes are so tiny compared to the volumes of food being moved in the UK. Just go ahead. Give them access to a market. Don't worry about it. it was, and I use the word truly. It, they were trivial, tiny, several orders of magnitude smaller. So this point about types of farming... Um, our choices. Now, now I come to, to my... This one's still working, isn't it? Good. All right. My demonstration. Is, I'm not sure if this is Blue Peter or 
the Open University or something like that. For those of you with UK um, reference points. Three types of farming. So I'm using these glasses, the glasses here and the water in them to represent yield. So we have industrialized farming systems that are very productive. They produce a lot of stuff. We have other kinds of systems that produce a lot, but not quite as much as the modern industrialized because they're trading off some of their production in order either not to cause damage to natural capital or to produce positive externalities. So there's a bit of a trade-off there. There are 2.4 billion people in the world who rely on agriculture that produces between half a tonne and a tonne per hectare. So average yields in the UK are eight tonnes per hectare. Average yields for getting on for a kind of third of the world, yeah, third of the world's population are that small, half a tonne per hectare. The research that we've been involved in um, uh, has been to assess the possibilities of understanding what happens when you move to more sustainable systems. Sustainability is my green food, food colouring here. Now, this is what happens with in our industrialised systems. I talked earlier about spillover effects. You can see what's coming. One of the problems with industrialised farming systems is they produce a lot, but they produce a lot of spillover effects. There are very few spillover effects from these systems. There are some from these, but they're trivial in comparison to the industrialized systems. What we seek to do, here we are, sustainable, <laughs> sustainable water. Our challenge, your challenge, is to turn that system green and still maintain the productivity, to increase the productivity a bit of this system, and to do what we can to increase the productivity of these systems. Now, the interesting point is that the evidence now shows that those currently poor-yielding agricultural systems in, in the South can more than double, sometimes triple their yields with the right kind of agroecological management, the right kind of farmer engagement. That is where the productivity increases of the future will come. Some will come from here, Few will come from here, but they could become greener. You might see that that's darker green and that's lighter green as we move across the system. There has been some debate, some international debate, as to whether we actually need to increase food production. Seven billion people, we're going to be nine billion. Uh, perhaps we just need to manage the wastes more, or move it around in different kinds of ways. Yes and yes, but the two and a half billion people who rely on agriculture, largely of the half a tonne to tonne per hectare area, they need more food production in their places, at, at the way that the current economy is, is, is configured. So I don't buy the argument that we don't need to increase food. We do, but we need to increase it in the right places and in the right way. Um, I first used a term in a paper in 1997, um, uh, in the title of a paper, where, I, where um, I coined the term sustainable intensification, which is now kind of widely used. It's not an evil term. It's not a slippery term, I don't think. Sustainable intensification simply means we must do more and better on existing lands. Sustainable intensification doesn't imply that one kind of agriculture, by definition, is better than another, or one kind of technology is better than another. It all depends on the outcomes. So I'm just interested in the outcomes at this point. Can we get the dark green agriculture and the yield increases in the right places and maintain the yields with green in the, in the rest of the places? If the answer is yes, to a certain extent, I don't mind how it's done. That's our challenge, is to find the ways to make that happen. Um, we now understand that if we burn forests, drain marshes, plough grasslands, all of these create substantial negative externalities for finite earth. It's worth noting that some international 
agencies, who will remain nameless, but I'll name them if you want me to, still say there are 200 million hectares, 200 mega hectares worldwide of available agricultural land into which we can expand. It's nonsense. It's ludicrous. There's nothing, un there's nothing available or unused. It's being used in some sort of way. There is a cost when we move agriculture beyond the gate to create another field. So my view is that there's a simple challenge. We need to create types of agriculture and farming that produce more whilst accumulating positive effects on natural capital. Now, in this sense, agriculture is actually a unique economic sector because it uses natural capital at the front end and it influences natural capital through its production processes. So if we get it right, of course then, there is a virtuous circle. It's using here, producing and influencing here, and using again. If it's negative at this point, agriculture diminishes its effect to be successful because it seeks to use something that is itself diminishing. So this is the trick. Not all, well, actually very few economic sectors have that potential to do that, to, to shape and use and then recycle around again. Lots of examples. It's not the place to go into them. Lots of technologies. No-till, for example, increases carbon in soils. The push-pull system of parasitoids and predators developed in, in uh, Kenya with Isipe and Rothamsted here to understand the, the, the role of semi-chemicals in sucking in the good insects and pushing away the bad insects without use of any inputs, completely through habitat design, is truly remarkable. Precision farming, targeting anything that you're going to use in a precise way, seems to me to be a critical principle. Treatment of farm animals with alternatives to antimicrobials. Agroforestry, mixed cropping, multiple cropping, all sorts of opportunities there, a, a pantheon of opportunities. So the key principle is to, again, fit those technologies to the agroecological circumstances. So in conclusion, I would make these points. Uh, in the last couple of years, the Royal Society here has produced a report called Reaping the Benefits, and the government's foresight project, Global Food and Farming Futures, um, produced a report in 2012. Both concluded that we need to increase food production by 2050 by around about 70%. It might be 50%, it might be 100%, but it's a lot more than we've got at the moment. As I said earlier, that has to come from existing land, hence the notion of, of repatriating back what was seen as a bad term for a long time, intensification, and tying it together with sustainable and saying, let's do more from existing land, but do it better. Do it much better. There are other problems that we haven't addressed here. I don't know if Tim's going to allude to any of these. Lots of other externalities, depends on system boundaries. Is the obesity crisis an externality of current food systems, for example. There's your answer, okay. We haven't even costed that. 30-plus um, percent in the US, 25 percent in the UK. In the mid-1980s, it was between 3 and 5 percent in a single generation, one human generation. That's the change. It must be an externality. We haven't included those in costs yet. Can this be done? Can this greening stuff be done? I think yes, and I think we should go forward with a yes. Can it be done by reducing the negative externalities and increasing the positive? Accentuate the positive, diminish the, the negative. There's a song there, isn't there? Um, it's more difficult, but again, I would say yes. So I would conclude by saying that we should, and we are able, to create agricultures that produce more whilst accumulating natural capital, and therefore, of course, it should be very tasty. Cheers. So th thank you very much, Jules. Hold your questions. We're going to have questions at the end of the panel here.